BAM! There went the Arizona. 95-year-old Stuart Headley was serving on the battleship West Virginia when waves of Japanese bombers ambushed American forces at Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. Planes were diving all over the place. Headley saw the Arizona explode and nearly break in half. That's when I saw about 32 bodies go flying through the air. 1177 men died instantly. The West Virginia was hit by nine torpedoes and two bombs. I'm a 20 year old brat, but I grew up overnight. Headley was in a gun turret leveled by one of the bombs. 11 men were killed. He and another survivor swam to shore. Fire was about three times as high as my house from the oil that was blazing between the shoreline and the ships. I thrashed like mad to get the oil and fire away. Hottest breath I ever breathed in my life. Twice I surfaced. The third time we were at the beach. At 104 years old, Ray Chavez is America's oldest surviving Pearl Harbor veteran. He was 27 when he joined the Navy and assigned to the minesweeper USS Condor. He had been on duty overnight before heading home to his wife and eight-year-old daughter. They lived in Navy housing across the street from Hickam Field. Chavez said he was asleep for just a few minutes when his wife started yelling. Wake up, wake up, but we're being attacked. And I said, what do you mean? She said, the, uh, the Japanese are here, they're attacking the harbor, and the harbor is on fire, and the whole harbor is in smoke, black smoke. And I said, oh, go on, nobody will attack us. So she said, come on, and then see for yourself. And I did, and I did see all the harbor on fire. Chavez got a ride and went right back to the minesweeper. He spent the next nine days on continuous duty. We got so busy preparing to go to sea that uh, nobody had time to think about anything except the job. 98-year-old Woody Derby was serving aboard the USS Nevada when it was hit by a torpedo and two bombs. Oh Christ, it was horrible. You could, uh, hard to believe what was going on because bombs were dropping all around. All their planes came in and they bombed the hell out of us. Derby remembers the gushing sound of water flooding his ship. We are the only battleship at Pearl Harbor that got underway and we started down the channel and uh, we cruised right on along down there and here came another string of bombers and we, they hit us, I think, three or four more times. And uh, they, we had 50 sailors were killed. There was a second wave of attacks. It's now about 9.25. And I look up and I see two planes approaching Florida Island and I yelled, duck! And we went into the beds, the cots, whatever we had, men, and all of a sudden glass just shattered all over the place. Gordon Jones was stationed at the Kaneohe Bay Naval Base during the attack. We could actually see the, the Japanese planes coming in, but we didn't know whether it was Japanese, and we don't know what we're doing. Big surprise. My brother, sir, he was injured. Uh, uh, engine in the leg. When the early morning blitz was over, more than 2,400 Americans had been killed, and the United States was thrust into World War II. December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. Today, there are fewer than 2,000 American survivors of the attack on Pearl Harbor. 19 are believed to live in San Diego. Yeah, yeah. Well, next Wednesday. Okay. okay, we'll see if you can stay a little are you going, uh, Are you going to Pearl? Each week, a handful of these survivors gather at Jesse Thompson's home in Bonita to bond over their shared experiences. 
Uh, here's what we usually do. We've been doing this now for maybe 18, 20 years, as we show a movie. Each year, there are fewer and fewer Pearl Harbor survivors. Still, those that can still speak at schools and to community groups. Jones, now 94, and members of the Pearl Harbor Survivors Association were instrumental in getting the USS Pearl Harbor commissioned and stationed in San Diego. Stu Headley, the president of the Pearl Harbor Survivors Association, worries people will forget about the significance and the sacrifices that were made in Pearl Harbor after they are gone. But as long as I'm alive, I am going to speak out. 187 aircraft were outside the head. Early in the morning, my husband and I had gone out onto the patio to have our second cup of coffee, and there were planes flying around, but you pay no attention to it because the military were doing that all the time. And where we lived, we were able, because our house was a little higher than Honolulu, and we could see Hickam Field and Pearl Harbor, and across the highway was the sugarcane field. And the sugarcane field was on fire, but paid no attention to that because that's the way they harvest the sugarcane. And then finally, we heard over the radio that we were being attacked by the Japanese and for all of us to go to our places of employment. My boss said, uh, Mary Lou, you're a local girl, aren't you? I understand your father has several companies. And so he said, would you call your father and ask him to send over as many trucks and drivers as he can? So I did. There had to be somebody with each truck driver, and I was one of them. Hickam Field obviously had been attacked as well as Pearl Harbor and they had slaughtered hundreds and hundreds of military at Hickam Field and there were hundreds of bodies laying all over the place. And what our jobs were was to check who was dead and who was alive. And if the young sweet man was alive, we load him on the trucks and then the drivers would take him up to Tripler Hospital. And the other ones would just stay till all the ones that were still alive got to Tripler. So we did that until about three o'clock in the afternoon. To see all these darling young men lying all over the place. I, I wasn't afraid, I was just more shocked, you know, than anything. I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. But then, you know, you do and have a job to do, so you do what you have to do. And I did it. This year marks the 75th anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor. December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. Jim Armstrong's parents experienced this firsthand 
Army Air Corps Lieutenant Jack Armstrong and Nurse Audrey Armstrong woke up in Hawaii to the sound of explosions and gunfire. Lieutenant Armstrong jumped in a car and sped to his post. On the way there, driving his 39 Ford, uh, speeding down the road, a uh, car pulled out in front of him. He slammed on his brakes. Evidently, he was being chased by a Zero. He watched a bomb go flying over and hit the car in front of him and take it out. So he ended up having to drive around that bomb crater to get to headquarters. Days after surviving the attack, Lieutenant Armstrong was sent to gather intelligence in Nihau, where a Japanese pilot had crash-landed and was killed after taking a hostage. He found the Nafoda sticks, which we assume were the ID for the pilot, and we're not quite sure uh, what the other sticks represented, but have since found out that they were sticks for different individuals, possibly Marines that worked on the plane. They gave them to him to carry on his flight on the attack, and they were found on the plane by my father. Years later, Jack Armstrong came home from the war with these relics and a sense that they belonged in Japan. Well, he had always wanted to return the property to any remaining family members uh, in Japan of that pilot. But Jack Armstrong died of Lou Gehrig's disease in 1985. His son inherited the sticks and his father's mission. I wanted to continue his quest to try and return the items to any proper family in Japan that were still surviving, um, where they should be and belong, in my opinion. After telling his story to the Union Tribune, Jim Armstrong was connected to the dead pilot's younger brother, Yoshitara. This week at Pearl Harbor, Armstrong will give temporary custody of the sticks to a Hawaiian museum. The sticks will be turned over to the Pacific Aviation Museum and from there returned to the family in Japan. For Jim Armstrong, this is a gesture of reconciliation and common decency. I think it's proper. If I was items that belonged to my father or grandfather, I would want them back. Jim Armstrong is a baby boomer, born after the war. Yet he looks forward to attending the 75th anniversary ceremonies at Pearl Harbor. I'm sure I'll be very emotional. I'm looking forward to meeting families of friends of my parents and their children and comparing stories and the stories that we all have to tell.